But Mr. Speaker, we all have a shared commitment to combating crime. The issue is how do we combat it, whether we are smart and effective on crime or whether we are in a situation where we are simply legislating for the sake of legislating and sending a signal as if we are tough on crime when in fact the very subject matter may already be present in the criminal code. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to share with the House the important measures introduced in Bill C-394, an act to amend the Criminal Code and National Defense Act criminal organization recruitment. The focal point of Bill C-394 is to protect Canadians, especially our youth, by making, an, making the act of criminal organization recruitment, or in other words, gang recruitment, an offense under Canadian law. All of us can agree that our youth are our future. Absolutely. This is a statement that holds no partisan or political undertone. Each one of us in this House and every Canadian would agree that our youth will define the trajectory of this country and that trajectory will be determined by the types of opportunities our youth are given. Young Canadians today have a sense of vulnerability about them. There are challenges that all youth face. My three young children constantly remind me of how important it is as a parent to provide for their safety and to protect them from any real or imagined dangers. I, like every parent, want the best for my children. I want them to be given every opportunity to succeed. To do this, I strive to create a safe environment in which they are free to grow and explore their potential. Unfortunately, not every kid or teenager gets to experience the life that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pressure to fit in or join a certain group are just too overwhelming, leaving youth vulnerable to those who might exploit their desire to belong. In a 2008 publication, the RCMP found that street gangs in Canada are increasingly aggressive with their recruitment tactics. In a disturbing trend, these criminal organizations are targeting youth under the age of 12 and as young as 8 years of old. These ruthless gangs pursue our vulnerable youth for several reasons. They know that those falling within this age range cannot be formally charged with a criminal offense. They also know that our youth can be easily pressured to participate in a variety of criminal activities. Our innocent and most vulnerable citizens are being manipulated, coerced, at, at times forced to embark on a life that no Canadian should ever experience. Gangs exploit our children by forcing them to participate in criminal activities such as drug dealing, robbery, theft, and prostitution. When I had the opportunity to speak with current and ex-gang members who led recruitment initiatives, they told me of a world that knew no boundaries. For instance, gang members will use drug addiction to manipulate potential recruits to take part in criminal activities that support the gang. This means that children, young kids, who should have been playing soccer on schoolyard are carrying weapons, drugs, and money. In the eyes of gang, these youth are dispensable and easily controlled. It is worrisome and heartbreaking that Canada's most violent criminal organizations actively recruit youth and teenagers. How can we as a nation sit by and watch this happen? I remember vividly what the director of Regina Anti-Gang Services told me as we sat side by side in a small room amongst hardened gang members seeking to exit that lifestyle. She told me that once recruited, these innocent children and teenagers were lost to the streets of the city forever. Promising young lives would vanish into the criminal culture forever. What makes this lifestyle so deadly is that leaving a gang is next to impossible. 
As I mentioned earlier, I had chance to speak with several former and current gang members. I sat beside a young man, a mere 19 years old, who had been a gang member for more than seven years. When I looked at him, I saw a kid. But as we got deeper into a discussion about his past, there was nothing in his life that resembled that of a youth. He was recruited into a gang at a very young age. Instead of school, friends, family, sports, he was robbing drug dealers, trafficking and attacking rival gang members and selling drugs on the streets. This was a kid who excelled in a criminal organization because that's the only life he knew. I can't help but picture his work ethics allowing him to lead an extraordinarily successful law-abiding life. Now he is battling a drug addiction, and because he is seeking to exit the gang, he constantly looks over his shoulder, fearing for his life. He told me that no matter what you do, you are never really out of gang. People that he recruited into the gang have experienced the same pain as him. He looked me in the eye and asked, by recruiting others into the gang, how many lives did I ruin? How many families did I hurt? And how many people have experienced pain at my hands? So I ask you, what type of life is this for a young person? We see lives being shattered by gangs, families destroyed, and our community safety placed in jeopardy. As a father, I fear the presence and power that a gang wields over a community and its most vulnerable citizens. As a members of parliament, I know there is more that we can do. In 2006, CSIS estimated that number of street gangs members under the age of 30 was approximately 11,000. Wow. The report cautioned that this number would continue to grow rapidly over the coming years. In Peel region, which my family and I call home, the number of gangs has exploded in the last few years. In 2003, there were 39. Today, there are well over 110 street gangs within our neighborhoods. This means more people live in fear, more young people are targeted, and more violence is used. Gang members in Canada have a blatant disregard for the safety and well-being of those around them. For instance, in some communities, families are afraid to leave their home or let their children play outside. Gangs also pose a significant risk for law enforcement officers. The increase in gang recruitment has far-reaching and systemic effect on our country as a whole. Our safety, security, and well-being are placed in jeopardy. The purpose of Bill C-394 is twofold. First and foremost, we're seeking to further protect our youth and our communities by criminalizing the act of gang recruitment. Far too many communities in Canada are facing a gang problem. It is widely important that we maintain the security and safety of our neighborhoods, our streets, and our families. By tackling gang recruitment, we can help reduce the number of innocent and vulnerable citizens who would otherwise be lost in this dead-end lifestyle forever. This is about protecting our children, our neighborhood, and our future. Criminal organizations use fear, intimidation, and violence to advance their objective and grow within a community. This behavior cannot be, can no longer be tolerated. Second, Bill C-394 is designed to provide law enforcement officers with additional tools to address gang recruitment. I had the opportunity to meet with numerous stakeholders across Canada to discuss this issue. The valuable insight we gained were used in the development of this bill. We spoke with several law enforcement officers who praised the bill's direction, scope, focus, and resourcefulness. The 2002 Canadian Police Survey on Youth Gangs conducted under contract to the Department of the Solicitor General Canada was the first of its kind in this country. This landmark study identified some startling figures. Of 264 Canadian police services surveyed, 
57% believe that youth gang problem is getting worse. Most concerning is the fact that 44% reported that youth gang members have established a relationship with larger organized crime groups. The common theme that we witnessed while meeting with law enforcement officers was that more tools that they have to fight what they call the war on gangs, the better the outcome can be. Bill C-394 has taken that request and seeks to augment current efforts. Youth gang membership has and will continue to grow in this country if we sit back and do nothing. Restorative and preventative approaches complement other justice responses to criminal activity, but they cannot replace them. Bill C-394 is focused on addressing the criminal action that allow a gang to proliferate, strengthen, and grow within our communities. We are tackling the criminal conduct that is destroying our youth's lives and placing others in jeopardy on a daily basis. With this being said, I strongly uh, committed to supporting balanced approach <coughs> to engage recruitment by advancing preventative and education-based program across this country. We are focusing on bolstering our law enforcement, legal justice system to respond to the increasingly aggressive gang recruitment strategies that are ongoing. Bill C-394 will allow our justice system to appropriately hold those who recruit individuals into criminal organizations accountable for their devastating actions. By doing so, we will be able to take these dangerous criminals off our streets for good. This not only maintains the safety and security of our communities, but it offers the opportunity to severely inhibit a criminal organization's growth. When I spoke with the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Winnipeg, he told me a story that exemplified the need for this proposed legislation. At one of their inner city club chapters, gang members will wait under the parking garage directly behind the building. Their sole purpose for being there is to engage those leaving Boys and Girls Club in hopes of recruiting them into their gangs, a targeted strategy that is not a coincidence. This example highlights the reality that our youth in our communities face. Education and prevention programs are only part of our response. We need to provide our justice system with the ability to respond through legal action. Imagine for a moment if these children, youth, teenagers were empowered to report those trying to recruit them. Imagine if our community members knew that something could be done about gang recruiters who operated in their neighborhoods. It would empower communities to take action. Today we have an opportunity not just as members of parliament, but as Canadians to come together and make a difference in our neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I urge each one of you to view this bill for what it is, an important new tool in our cr criminal justice system that will benefit families, communities, and future generations. It is time that we take back our streets from criminal organizations that are increasingly threatening their grip on our freedom, safety, and security. It is time we take a stand so that every child, teenager, and adult can experience the life that they deserve to live. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci beaucoup. At the outset, I want to announce that the NDP will support this bill, Bill C-394, at second reading. But this isn't a blank check. We will be considering this bill in detail in committee with expert witnesses, and we will examine each clause in Bill C-394 and look at what amendments may be needed. I'm pleased to speak today on Bill C-394, an act to amend the Criminal Code and the National Defense Act. This is a private member's bill that amends the Criminal Code and creates a new offense 
with respect to organized crime, which is the recruitment of someone for an organized crime organization. There is already a set of rules in the criminal code prohibiting criminal organizations, the participation in criminal organization activities, an offense for the benefit of a criminal organization, or charging a or giving a person directions to commit an offense for such an organization. This bill would add a fourth offense, which would be that of recruiting an individual for a criminal organization as defined in the criminal code to increase the ability of such an organization to carry out criminal acts. Through this bill, my honorable colleague would like to reduce the recruitment by gangs. Gangs are criminal organizations that exist across Canada and have done so for decades in Quebec, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. Criminal organizations, these gangs are growing and we must do everything we can to combat them. Gangs are changing in how they work, and there are increasing numbers of young people joining them. The members of gangs are often young people from vulnerable socioeconomic backgrounds with family problems. The gangs also target young girls and those who are in prison. I would like to thank my colleague for having introduced this bill that is at least a partial solution to the gang problem. Public safety and security is a priority for the official opposition, and we are always very interested in examining any kind of legislation that would amend the criminal code. However, although I acknowledge the legitimacy of this bill sponsored by my colleague, I believe that the penalties under this new provision are inappropriate. The bill calls for a maximum sentence of five years and for recruitment of a minor, a mandatory minimum sentence of six months. The principle of mandatory minimums is one that has been criticized from a legal point of view because it deprives judges of their discretionary powers, which are fundamental. This penalty would therefore restrict the powers of judges. We feel that we do need to take action against criminal organizations, but this will not be enough to eliminate the problem of gangs and their influence in our society. Prevention is as important as enforcement and repression, and we have to encourage more programs to be set up to help young people who live in cities where gangs are particularly present so that our society can move in a positive direction. We also need to encourage cooperation among the various stakeholders. To illustrate my remarks, I would quote Louis Lacroix, who is responsible to, uh, for a program dealing with young offenders in Montreal. And he said that all of us were doing good work in our area of expertise, but no one was able to really deal with the gang problem. American studies have shown that a concerted approach within a community is more likely to succeed than any action that is taken in a silo. There are various projects that have been carried out in various provinces, and the federal government through the National Crime Prevention Center, the schools, the associations, the music industry, various foundations, banks, municipalities, the legal profession, correctional services, and the police have all taken part. It is important to 
build on these initiatives and the government should support them. It is essential to provide the funding and the human resources to police officers on the front lines. However, it seems that the current government has failed in this responsibility. It has not taken into account the suggestions made by these professionals who deal every day with street gangs. I would also like to quote the report comparing the approaches used with young people at high risk of being brought into gangs that was made public in 2011. And the report indicated that in 2009, there was a meeting with the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police that led to the recommendation and adoption of a national strategy to deal with gangs. The strategy would help by providing additional police resources so that street gangs could be dealt with. But this strategy has not yet been adopted. This shows that the current government is refusing to provide funding for municipal frontline officers and lacks vision to deal with public security. The Conservatives say that they want to deal with criminal organizations by trying to reduce recruitment of people into gangs, but they are not meeting the needs of our can, uh, Canadian public. They announced in 2011 that they were going to slash the funding for the activities uh, that tried to fight gangs. The NDP reacted to that and uh, called for prevention programs. And because of the NDP, the Harper government changed its mind and provided funding for the program. The government has disappointed the provinces by not providing enough funding to recruit more frontline police officers. Though the fund was created in 2008, it will expire in 2013. And once again, the Conservatives have not kept their promise. Canadians are expecting that this House will take reasonable steps to meet their expectations because living in communities without crime and violence is a priority. This bill is a partial solution, but we need a balanced approach between repression and prevention so that our society will be more harmonious. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the debate this evening is on Bill C-394 and criminal organization recruitment, it reflects and indeed invites initial comment on the overall approach to uh, criminal policy by the Conservative government in general. For in this bill, we see the problems of this generic approach to criminal law, namely that everything is a matter for the criminal law, even if there already exists an offense in the criminal code on this issue, that the only way to address these criminal matters is through the prism of punishment, and that the best approach to punishment is through the use of mandatory minimums. Frankly, Mr. Speaker, this is at variance with long-standing principle, policy, and an evidence-based approach to criminal justice. And the government's preoccupation with this type of legislating is not only somewhat disingenuous, but also ineffective, wasteful, prejudicial, constitutionally suspect, and simply put, bad public policy. I realize that colleagues in this place may be somewhat surprised that I'm beginning with this type of uh, approach and perspective. But I believe that as a chamber, given this whole approach to policymaking, that we must take a step back and gain some perspective on what we are doing. I know that the government is very quick to pounce on, on these type of critiques and to label those who make them, uh, be it 
the Liberal Party or others or myself as being soft on crime. But Mr. Speaker, we all have a shared commitment to combating crime. The issue is how do we combat it, whether we are smart and effective on crime or whether we are in a situation where we are simply legislating for the sake of legislating and sending a signal as if we are tough on crime when in fact the very subject matter may already be present in the criminal code. And so, Mr. Speaker, if one looks at the legislation, it proposes to punish anyone, and I quote, who recruits, solicits, encourages, or invites a person to join a criminal organization. This offense would become the new section 467.111 of the criminal code. But, Mr. Speaker, and this is the important point, enhancing the ability of a criminal organization is already a crime under the criminal code. Section 467.11 of the code, the very section to which this bill adds a subsection, clearly states, and I quote, every person who for the purpose of enhancing the ability of a criminal organization to facilitate or commit an indictable offense under this or any other act of parliament, knowingly, by act or omission, participates in or contributes to any activity of the criminal organization is guilty of an indictable offense. Mr. Speaker, I have no problem with legislation that sometimes seeks to make a necessary clarification to the law or indeed to enhance the law. But what is being suggested here is that somehow without this bill there will be a no offense with respect to gang recruitment. Yet recruitment previously was one of the issues on the minds of the legislators themselves in this House, as evidenced by the fact that when enacting Section 467.11 in 2001, uh, the then Minister of Justice, Anne McClellan, said in this place upon the introduction of what is currently in the Criminal Code, and I quote, in order to reference that this was already anticipated and then implemented as, as law, and I quote, we know that successful recruitment enhances the threat posed to society by criminal organizations. It allows them to grow and to more effectively achieve their harmful criminal objectives. Those who act as recruiters for criminal organizations contribute to these ends both when they recruit for specific crimes and when they recruit simply to expand the organization's human capital. Thus, the expressed provisions of the proposed participation offense make it clear that the Crown does not in making its case need to link the impugned participation, in this case recruitment, to any particular offense. In fact, these words could have been spoken by the introducer of this particular bill because that particular section in the Criminal Code already covers what this bill uh, purports to do as reflected in the words of the then Justice Minister at the time. Indeed, and Mr. Speaker, this is the current state of the law in Section 467.11 of the Criminal Code goes on to note that in a prosecution for an offense under Section 1, subsection 1, it is not necessary for the prosecutor to prove and to go through a whole series of factors which, for reasons of time, I will not enter into here, only to state that if one looks at the offense, one sees that it, it already covers that which this bill purports to do. Mr. Speaker, I don't therefore wish to dwell on some of those technical points of law. Suffice it to say that the behavior that new offense seeks to criminalize is something already criminal under another provision of the criminal code. And indeed, whatever act that would give rise to this proposed section would also likely be criminal under another section, such as the offenses relating to counseling, aiding, abetting, conspiracy, and the like. As such, Mr. Speaker, Bill C-94 is both duplicative and arguably duplicitous as well. Duplicative in that it essentially repeats what is already in the Criminal Code, and somewhat duplicitous in that it is being presented as if this is our only option with respect to combating gang recruitment, and as if there is no present offense that deals with this issue before us, and that those who somehow will oppose this uh, piece of legislation are again, as I indicated, somehow soft on crime or don't care about street gangs and the like. As I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, in my introduction, conservative crime policy, regrettably, is all about punishment. Yet, Mr. Speaker, we should be seeking to prevent young people from joining gangs to begin with. This involves an understanding and appreciation of the serious initiatives 
that need to be taken with respect to education, social services, and the like, in order to allow people to stay in, in school for as long as they can, to provide them with employment opportunities, so that young people are shown that there are alternatives to gang life. Yet, Mr. Speaker, this would involve, and this is the core of my remarks here this evening, this would remark, would regard and require us to address the underlying causes and concerns relating to gang crime. Housing, poverty, income equality, employment, minority inclusion, access to education and the like, and an understanding of why young people, in fact, do join uh, gangs. Mr. Speaker, there is no young person in Canada contemplating gang life because they believe there is no offence against it or their recruitment in the criminal code. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, as I said, there are plenty of offences in the criminal code, an ever-expanding list that has grown tremendously with the adoption of Bill C-10. And yet, this does very little to address the root causes and concerns of crime. In fact, many of them will only lead to an increase in crime. Here, Mr. Speaker, I am speaking in particular of mandatory minimum penalties, something which Bill C-3946 seeks to add yet again to the criminal code in the matter of gang recruitment. While I have spoken many times in this House on this point, once again one finds an ignoring or marginalizing of the evidence with respect to the fallout of mandatory uh, minimums. Simply put, not only do we know that mandatory minimums do not deter crime, rather they tend to increase crime, both within prisons, which become schools for crime, and outside prisons. They do not deter crime is not my conclusion, Mr. Speaker. It is one reached by studies the world over and even our own Justice Department here in Canada. They remove necessary prosecutorial and judicial discretion, leading to pleas for lesser offences or forcing trials where there may have been none. This clogs the courts and, as the Canadian Bar Association has warned that, with the addition of more mandatory minimums, we may end up in a situation where more accused are in fact set free, contrary to the intention and objectives of the government's legislation to begin with, simply because their charter right to a fair trial within a reasonable period of time has been invited. Moreover, mandatory minimums will lead to further overcrowding in prisons. Yet prisons in this country are already overcrowded, and we have seen in the U.S. court judgments that overcrowding amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. Lastly, though perhaps most important, such sentences also invite constitutional critiques and have struck down such mandatory minimums as we saw recently in the Ontario courts for being cruel and unusual, arbitrary, disproportionate, outrageous and intolerable. While I do not have the time to elaborate further, Mr. Speaker, I would like to conclude by simply reminding members that the criminal law should be as much about prevention as it should be about punishment, and our approach to social evils should be as much to ensure that individuals and groups have a viable way of avoiding that which leads them into gang recruitment through all the causes and concerns that I addressed earlier in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah.